thanks a lot. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for coming. I'm Gusta, I do machine learning and artificial intelligence and stuff, and uh, as, a, as my PhD. Uh, so ideally I would be speaking about this lifted relational neural network framework that I'm working on, I've been working on for the past few years uh, as part of my PhD thesis, uh, but then I realized that uh, there's not a conference and you probably uh, would miss uh, the typical target audience I'm, I'm speaking to mostly, so I've created some hand-waving introduction about machine learning and learning with logic and this little bit unorthodox approach to machine learning. Uh, so this is what I will start with, just to motivate why this might be a good idea and uh, where does this framework of learning fits into, into the global landscape of machine learning, which is probably uh, what majority of people never heard about. This is joint work with my supervisors, mainly Ondra Kuzalka. I mean, the latter part about the lifted relational neural networks, not the hand-waving introduction part, which he probably wouldn't uh, like me to get related him into. Uh, but anyway, so speaking of uh, starting on a very general note, so this is machine learning meetup. So what is machine learning? Uh, actually, it's kind of interesting that I didn't find any a uh, reasonable definition of machine learning is uh, all you can find is these vague uh, notions. Uh, you probably mo mostly heard the one uh, from Tom Mitchell, learning from, uh, with a, a task T from experience E, and you're measuring some performance P, uh, whatever. It's so vague that it doesn't uh, really imply anything. So I took the liberty to add uh, uh, even more uh, wake and general introduction uh, into this myself. So this is my way view of uh, machine learning. You start very simply with the universe. And uh, in that universe, you're probably interested in some support, let's call it a system of interest, which is this nice little bla black box that you cut out of the universe, which basically creates this interface of on the border of the original system. This doesn't have to be in, in space time or whatever, it can be abstract space. Let's say the system of interest is a, a human and you just cut out all the humans out of the universe and uh, you're not interested in the rest. Now, what you're mostly interested in, though, so the important part is that, so machine learning is roughly about modeling or approximating uh, complex real world systems with some uh, generic uh, predefined architectures. What is important in here, the system is a complete black box or, or ping box in this case, and the only thing you're observing is the uh, data flowing through the interface. In and out, sometimes it's not really obvious what is in and what is out, so you're just modeling the data jointly, and it can cover all sorts of complexities, like the data can be flowing in time, the system can be um, of stochastic nature, and so on. Um, so let's say, we have some input data and output data is deterministic system, so in this case represented by this functional mapping of the input to output, and the data is the only thing we observe. Now, oh, that was a little bit too fast. Okay, so now a part of the system of interest, we have this, what we call a hypothesis space, which lives possibly outside of the universe, where we have a lot of prototypes, little hypotheses of how the system might work, represented by all these different sorts of functions, A, B, C, mapping the input data to all different sorts of output data. In case of, so this is the case of supervised machine learning, which is what people mostly call machine learning. And uh, what we do with the hypothesis space uh, is we search for a hypothesis that maps the same input data to something else that ideally is somewhat close to the real observed data Y, and if that is the case, we can, with some uh, reasonable assumptions, say that our hypothesis G, which lives in completely different space than the original system, but as observed through the data, is somewhat close to the function that the actual system might embody. So this is just an, uh, a diagram shamelessly stolen from some machine learning course, I think learning from data from Caltech, which gives you the overview of this routine. So the hypothesis set 
is whatever is the generic uh, model that you a priori decide to work with, you know, neural networks, decision trees, SVMs, or whatever. You, know, you have the system which implements the unknown target function that generates the data in response to the input vector that is generated you know, by the surrounding universe, sampled from its probability distribution P, gives you this uh, vector of random variables, x1 to xn, and then you have this learning algorithm uh, box, which is basically a, a search routine, an optimization routine that searches through this hypothesis that set for a hypothesis that is able to explain or match the input-output data sample as observed coming in and out of the system with respect to some performance metric evaluating discrepancy between you know, the Y and uh, Y dashed. If you find the one that you're happy with, you call it your final hypothesis G, and that's the whole routine of machine learning. This is very general. It's, if, you, if you notice, this is, is no more specific than, uh, than uh, what I was originally complaining about at the original slide. It's actually so general that it applies for pretty much anything in, in, uh, in any scientific field or any field following the scientific method for in, I don't know, biology, chemistry, physics. In physics, you do absolutely exactly the same thing. Maybe the only difference being that in physics, your final hypothesis better be 99.999% correct. If it's not like that, anything below is machine learning, anything above is uh, physics. So that's why machine learning is like safe haven for failed physicists. Um, so anything better than random still goes in machine learning. So I said it's very general, but I have one problem with generality of this, of this uh, diagram, and that is the representation of the data given by the universe or given by the interface between the system of interest and the universe. And that is the representation of it as a vector of, or a tuple of random variables, which turns machine learning, all machine learning representations, most of them that we are used to work with, into learning from this. So, this is what you probably know, you know, every row in the table is a learning example, every column in the table is an um, attribute or so-called feature. So we have this uh, bunch of feature vectors, that's what you feed into Weka, RapidMiner, Scikit, TensorFlow, whatever you like, and this is the representation upon which most of the models, you know, those guys from the hypothesis space are designed to work with. And this is a really good idea because you know, you work with computers, you know that a lot of stuff can be represented as an outcome of a random uh, variable, I mean, of random experiment uh, represented as a numerical value of the random variable. You know, it can be colors, age, you can turn uh, pixel intensity values, pretty much everything into the numbers in these columns. So it seems like it's very general and pretty much anything that we need to do learning or any, any kind of the system. Uh, and basically turns machine learning into statistics. So if we are uh, following this assumption that these guys, these fixed size feature vectors are drawn identically and independently from this original probability distribution that was the, the red guy on the, on the diagram, uh, we are in the realm of a uh, normal statistical analysis. So this is this uh, multi-dimensional continuous uh, feature space. And the only thing we pray of the best thing we can possibly wish for is to model the probability density function on this, uh, on this feature space or the joint uh, space, including the output uh, variable in case that we know what is input and output. So in case of supervised machine learning or more generally in the case of unsupervised learning we want the whole joint probability distribution. So that means the machine learning um, in the statistical interpretation is really pretty much like this. Uh, you are given a bunch of data, a bunch of rows in, the, in this table. You calculate the mean. You calculate, you know, you might pre-calculate a lot of stuff and there is a lot of different ways how to marginalize on the table and uh, pre-calculate all so different sorts of statistics apart from the mean, but the mean is really what you're interested in uh, in the end because when the prediction time comes and someone 
you know, gives you a new feature vector, a new row, and just leaves out some of the columns blank and asks you, okay, so what is uh, the missing value for this column? The best thing you can possibly do is to predict the mean. And uh, so you say, okay, I don't know, but probably it will be somewhere around the mean. And in the mean case, you'll be probably correct. And this is uh, what the machine learning is about. It's really about giving you these uh, confidence intervals as drawn on this, as uh, drawn on the on the diagram with the Gaussian, which gives you the probability that the real mean will be very different from what you measured on the finite sample of the of the training data. Uh, uh, this thing has a long latency. Um, so that's the motto of uh, machine learning or statistical machine learning, which is really the normal machine learning that everyone does. Uh, is hey, or at least if done properly. This is a statistical problem. You utilize lots of big numbers. You know, if the sample is big enough, then probably the mean will uh, approach the real mean from the distribution that the data was generated uh, very fast. And uh, the probability that I'm very far from the real hypothesis, from, so from the real probability distribution that was generating the data, you know, the system of interest, which might be as well stochastic, not just the function that I had in there, but the generalization of that into probability distributions. And uh, then we just really utilize these uh, probabilistic inequalities, Chebyshev, Herding, that is what the whole uh, machine learning theory, at least in the probably approximately correct sense, is about. And gives you answer to this essential question of, okay, if I'm given this data, I choose from this hypothesis space, this decision tree or SVM of, or a neural net, how likely is that the at the prediction time, I will be uh, very wrong. And you, of course, want to minimize this probability. Now, this looks good. This is actually very powerful because these results are independent or irrespective of what the actual probability distribution is. So there are no prior assumptions on the, on the shape of the probability distribution. So that looks pretty good, but there's a bunch of these uh, crazy guys with uh, a kind of unorthodox approach to machine learning, saying that this is not enough, that we would want something more from uh, machine learning, at least if you're thinking about it as uh, you know, the core part of artificial intelligence, possibly you want abstraction, you want reasoning, you want to be able to uh, learn from structured data, to utilize symbolic knowledge, and so on. And this is the view they take on learning. So learning is something like the opposite, like the complement to logical inference. And this is why we need it. So from that view, so I said, you work with computers, you know that pretty much anything can be represented by numbers. You can feed all different uh, kind of stuff into, in, into computers and generalize from that, given the probabilistic uh, inequalities and assumptions about the distributions. You can encode all different sorts of stuff about the learning examples and generalize from that for the, uh, for the missing rows. So this looks like possibly the most general thing that we could, we could wish for until you see it in this context and it is just not so general anymore. And uh, this, I hope, looks somewhat familiar, familiar to uh, a number of you. At least I hope this is where the real world data is mostly stored in. It's stored in relational databases. It's not stored in feature vectors. You need to do some kind of pre-processing to get to the feature vectors, and then you can do machine learning. But that's not uh, how the data, how the interface to the system originally looks like. It's relational databases, knowledge graphs, you know, all different sorts of graphs, networks, diagrams, or actually diagram itself is a relational structure. And uh, so you would like to be able to learn in these cases as well, where you're not actually able to even recognize what are the features, uh, even what are the learning examples. So is this row, one row in this uh, table, the learning example, or is, it, uh, is this whole learning database the learning example itself? What kinds of questions can I ask? What kinds of guarantee do I get? And so on, that's where so-called relational machine learning kicks in, 
uh, to answer these uh, sorts of questions. And while looking for a more general formalism, more general representation of the learning examples and possibly the learning problem itself, they move to a more powerful formalism. So in here we had this statistics over fixed size numeric feature vectors. In here we have a relational database. So with relational databases are typically uh, formalized in as this relational calculus or relational algebra. So they thought, okay, how about we frame the problem in relational logic, which can describe this case as well, of course, as this case uh, of the single table. And that's what they did. So that's uh, where the so-called relational machine learning, or sometimes you hear it under the name of inductive logic programming, which is somewhat uh, more prominent in Europe, and relational uh, machine learning in America. Uh, this was the original idea. Okay, so if you use a more powerful language to represent uh, the learning examples and actually the learning problem itself, we can get all these uh, uh, sorts of nice properties. I can represent the learning examples, that means the tuples from the relational database by logic classes. So, okay, I'll show examples how to do that later. But the learning models themselves, even the hypothesis space, can be represented by logic classes or logic theories. And there's this extra feature that the normal statistical models typically lack, and that is I can incorporate some kind of prior expert knowledge about the learning problem, again in the form of logic clauses, because this first order logic language happens to be somewhat really expressive. Um, so this is what the learning or the, or the notion of learning looks like from a logical perspective. So you all probably know the first part, so that's what logic is good for, right? I have effect A, I've ruled that uh, from A follows B, then I can infer, deduce, that if A holds, then B holds as well. I can go the other way around and, some, and explain if I, uh, if I know that B holds and I know that this rule holds, that it might be the case that it was because of A. And what we will be most interested in this presentation is somewhat the complete inverse of the deduction, that is induction, if I'm observing a lot of cases where A and B holds at the same time, I can induce that probably, that's the learning part, B falls from A or vice versa actually. Probably can't uh, recognize which direction it is. So, uh, a brief intermezzo into logic programming, which might uh, uh, which you might not be familiar with. Um, it's a declarative programming paradigm. Basically, you instead of procedurally coding how to get from the input to output, you ideally somewhat state what are all the facts and rules that hold true in your world, and let uh, the inference machine, you know, the the engine of the of the logical programming language, in our case, mostly Prolog, pretty much the only logical. Uh, programming language that is alive still uh, to answer or to compute uh, the answer for you. It is based on a subset of first order logic or the horn clause logic. Basically, you can imagine this the rules. So, horn clauses are rules that look like this. If and they read from right to left, which is a little bit unnatural, but that's how it is. So, in the logical program, I can have facts look like this, so I have this um, constant or this object in my universe, it's called Tom, and it's a type of a cat. And I also know that if something is a cat, then it is an animal. And this is how you do programming in logic, particularly in Prolog. And this might look weird, but you can really use this to do Turing complete programming and do with recursion, you can do uh, anything you like, just like in the other programming languages. So, this is the formalism we're going to use. And uh, this is how the program computes. So, in logical programming, again, I'm starting with some facts. This can be the learning examples, this can be part of the background knowledge, this can be learned, part of the model as well. As I said, in the formalism, it doesn't really matter because everything is just logical clauses. This is a logical clause, unit ground clause. 
it just happened to be called a fact. This is the horn clause, a rule, and I can be asking for, instance, this can be a prediction or answer to my query, you know, the inference, deduction. So this is a deductive case. I'm asking, who is the aunt of n? I start, uh, you know, the inference engine, which is really nothing, just a depth first search through the space of the clauses. I'm trying to unify, you know, the variables with the constants that I have in my universe, n, Bob, J, K, and so on, uh, until I reach some uh, the correct answer that gives me this we call it proof path, so this would be called a proof tree or SLD tree in the case of Prolog. And, you know, does the resolution, tries to search for possible explanation for owned and something, in this case, Bob, uh, through the application of this rule. Someone is an owned or someone, if he has a sister, and, uh, and uh, that sister is a parent of, no, sorry, the other way around and uh, that sister has a parent. And uh, okay, so this is how you do inference in logic programming and it creates the, the computation of the program, creates a proof tree that looks like this. So this is what will be on your stack when you run uh, the, log the logic program. Okay, and uh, you can imagine you can possibly do the other way around. So this was inference, this was deduction, going from, uh, from facts to, through rules to new facts, you could probably run it the other way around, do the inverse resolution. So starting from facts given in use from bottom up, the rules that explain, that lead to these facts that I observe. And that is exactly the idea of inductive logic programming, which is to, roughly speaking, inverse this deduction into induction. So starting from facts, which will be the learning examples in this case, which expressed in the logic clauses, so in the more general formalism, which can cover funny stuff like uh, this uh, famous uh, learning example uh, for ILP. So imagine you have these two sorts of trains, one of them, uh, one of uh, well, five of them, one set is going east, one set is going west. You have uh, the representation in this, uh, with these funny uh, shapes. And so you have a locomotive with different numbers of cars of different lengths, carrying on different shapes inside. Some of them have roofs, some of them don't. And somehow, there's a pattern in them that you should explore to be able to classify into these two distinct sets of going east and west. So there is this hypothesis, we'll get to it. So this is how you represent the problem in logic. Uh, so you probably are thinking about how to you know, feed this into SVM or neural network. You could probably just take the pictures and uh, feed it into a convolutional net or something like that. Uh, if we have finite resolution, you would probably run into problems pretty soon. And, uh, you know, these trains can be of unbounded length. Uh, there's no a prior definition of uh, what the possible shapes can be, of what all, all the possible combinations can be. So that's why we run into problems with fixed size representations that are necessary for all the classical statistical machine learning models. Okay, so back to representation in logic. So this is how you represent uh, the problem in logic. So you have these uh, two sets of uh, five and five trains. You give them some names. And for instance, this is how we represent the first train as sets of propositions in logic. So, you know, the locomotive has some car. You give it an identifier, just as you would in the relational database. So you would have one table that would be called uh, short for all the cars that are short. This one happens to be closed as well. Then you have some other one that is long and open and so on and so on. And this car that is long and open has a rectangle inside and the other one has also a rectangle, blah, 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 blah. This one has a different number, uh, number of rectangles, three of them and so on. So this, uh, for this you would need the whole relational database uh, to represent the problem. Uh, it wouldn't suffice with a single table. Uh, 
Okay, so, and this is how the ILP uh, learning paradigm goes about uh, learning the hypothesis to classify into these two distinct sets. You start with something, for instance, you start with something super specific. So you just basically take one train that you would like to classify as positive. Let's say it's eastbound in this case. And you just remove um, all the identifiers, generalize them into variables, so that it, now it still covers only the one positive example and hopefully start to generalize this representation uh, into something that covers more than just one positive example while hopefully not covering any of the negative example. And if you are able to do that all the way up, you might end up with a hypothesis that, for instance, looks like this that uh, correctly classifies into the trains going east and those going west. So train is going east if it is some car that is short. You know, some of them have uh, are kind of long like this one. Some of them are short, and it's closed, meaning it has a roof. Okay, so this is how inductive. So this might look very weird, but it really fits the uh, the whole diagram of machine learning. It's just this hypothesis space. In this case, is is discrete and very large. It's typically structured. You can draw a, a lattice between the uh, particular hypothesis with respect to some refinement step that would be the generalization in the, in, the, in the case that I've shown. And then you rely on the learning algorithm to search through this hypothesis space, which in this case is a little bit more complicated than in the, in the statistical, uh, in the typical statistical machine learning case where you are working with this continuous feature vector representations and with respect to some error function, you most typically just, you know, hill climbing or actually do going down the hill uh, with the st in the steepest direction. In here, you really need some uh, discrete state space search, beam search or whatever with a bunch of heuristics to prune it. Uh, but the idea is the same. You're searching through the hypothesis space to come up with the one that uh, matches best your criteria. So it's an optimization problem as pretty much anything in AI. Uh, this is just an uh, overview again to, do, uh, to sort of appreciate the more uh, the generality of, the, of this approach. You're really able to capture much more uh, complex learning settings than you are with the feature vectors arbitrarily structured, arbitrarily uh, shaped, arbitrarily sized examples, or it can actually be just one big example and you're just asking different parts of it. So all the assumptions of uh, normal statistical learning, like the examples are independent of each other and identically distributed is false. You're searching through the lattice of all possible logical classes that satisfy some nice properties. For instance, with respect to the background knowledge that you can be given in the beginning, and uh, to finally come up with something that correctly classifies and also explains why it correctly classifies. Now, <clears throat> okay, so this looks kind of reasonable, but this is how most people uh, think about it uh, still, because the arguments are like, Okay, this is not how the brain works like, right? I'm, I'm not searching through a lattice of uh, my logical theories in my head when I'm trying to solve a problem and uh, all sorts of stuff like that. And they're probably right, uh, but it's probably good to take a look at the pros and cons a little bit more explicitly. So the plus for sure is that learning now is a completely general and generic task. It even covers, so you're basically learning programs, right? So it can cover even abilities such as planning or programming. Then the classifier can be really complex. The data that you can uh, learn from can be really complex. Uh, you can incorporate the background knowledge. You can interpret what's being learned because it's a program. Um, you can you know, decompose the program into modules, you know, subroutines, all the stuff that you do in programming. You can do all sorts of magic that people are trying to basically reinvent, for instance, with the deep learning now, like you know, zero-shot learning and transfer learning and uh, fancy stuff like that. It's all here in logic for free explicitly. Um, but there are some cons. Uh, the big one is there's no uh, explicit handling of uh, probability or uncertainty or noise in the data. All the rules or the facts are crisp, so if A holds, and a, uh, from A follows B, then B holds for sure. 
there are no similarities over the symbols. So if A is a, you know, a, uh, a dog and then B is a cat, and you it knew something about the dog, it's quite likely that it will hold for the cat as well, but it's in logic it's two completely different symbols, so there's no uh, notion, explicit notion of similarity that you could use to transfer the knowledge from cat to dog if it's not given by the rules. And last but not least, actually this is the main problem as I see it, it's very slow. Mostly NP complete and hard problems, even worse than that. Actually in the more general case, in just the inference step. It's an undecidable problem, so that's probably not what you would expect uh, from a machine learning system that should work in practice. So that's still how majority of people uh, feel about it, and they're probably right. Uh, so that's where so-called SRLs, that is relational learning kicks in, and this is where mm, I'm trying to, trying to fit in, and. Uh, this is where most of the uh, current research is happening. And the motto in here is, so for statistic learning, yeah, it's just uh, statistics over flat feature vectors. From the logical point of view, yeah, we just need induction and all the world around us is just logical theories. They both have their pros and cons and uh, this field is trying to marry the pros from both while trying to you know, diminish uh, the cons. <clears throat> so. Oh, that's a nice feature. So SRL is really about learning from relational data. You know, this uh, complex uh, uh, graphs, hypergraphs, logical theories, and stuff that I have shown with noise, with some implicit notion of uh, probability at some of the frameworks or something a little bit more vaguely defined as in the case of a neural network. So there's no explicit probabilities, but some mechanism to handle the uncertainty. Now, one basic idea <coughs> of, uh, of SRL is, okay, so how to utilize statistical learning for relational problems is this, they call it propositionalization. It's really to take the relational structure, turn it into the fixed size feature vector that you're used to work with, that you can you know, feed into scikit and everything, and then just work with it as it, if it was the feature vector at the very beginning. Now, this is a Mm, very straightforward, but also very powerful, neat idea, and majority of the systems work like this under the hood, even though they're presented in different ways. Uh, it's nice, but what we don't like about it is that this mapping, this aggregative mapping, turning the relational structure, or this can be the relational database, it's a graph in this case, that's just a special case of it, <coughs> it needs to be defined in advance this aggregative mapping into the feature vectors. And you're necessarily losing some information about the original relational structure because uh, yeah, it's just not possible to turn arbitrarily sized, arbitrarily structured graph into a fixed size feature vector. Otherwise, you have just trivially solved the graph isomorphism problem. So, and if that information that you decided to aggregate out of the relational structure happens to be relevant or important for the machine learning task at hand, you're out of luck. So what we're trying to do <coughs> is to come up with a better story, uh, pretty much riding the, <coughs> uh, the wave of deep learning success. How about we don't turn, don't create this manual feature vector representations in advance, but try to have the model learn it end-to-end -end from scratch. So we started with, with a raw representation of the relational data in the most general formalism that you can have, that's the relation logic, which still might look a little bit alien to you, but it covers all sorts of interesting cases, such as graphs. <coughs> so graph, so this is how you represent graphs in uh, relation logic, or propositionally in this case, actually. Um, and that's a particularly useful data structure. I hope we all agree on that, which can represent, for instance, molecules, or social networks, or computer networks, or whatever. And uh, okay, so this is where we come to what I'm working on, actually. So we call it lifted relational neural networks because it. <clears throat> so it's a way to make neural networks learn from relational data, and the way we do it is to follow so-called lifted modeling strategy, 
which is which is not new. It works for some other models as well. For instance, uh, Markov networks. So if you lift a Markov network and you use um, this uh, uh, language of first order logic for it, you create a bunch of models that's called Markov logic uh, networks. And uh, okay, in that case, what it really does, okay, I probably should give some intro about lifted buzzword in here. What it really does, so, so in Markov network, you're parametrizing probabilistic relationships between particular variables, you know, like uh, it still can learn from relational data, like for instance, the social network. So I can, uh, you know, constrain probabilistic relationship that if uh, I'm a smoker, a friend of mine, you know, through this relationship of friendship will be smoking as well. But that's what you, you would risk. So a particularly person, you know, Josh is a friend with Anne and Josh smokes, then Anne smokes as well. And this uh, rule can be probabilistic. But what you really want to express is not a probability between this particular Josh and Anne, but between sets of all people that are in the friendship relationships. And uh, that's where the word lifted comes in. It's about parametrizing between sets of random variables as opposed to between particular random variables, as is in the case of you know, normal Markov network or Bayesian network or whatever, uh, but you parametrizing on the level of sets on higher level of abstraction for which you're using the language of first order logic uh, to describe the sets, you know, for instance, all friends of N or all people or things like that. And the idea in here is somewhat similar. So the lifted relational neural nets, again, look like, actually they look, exactly the same as Markov logic from the syntactical point of view. You start with a weighted logical program that for instance says this, okay, so water holds true if there's a OH bond between some two variables X and Y, and I'm kind of 0 0.5 certain about this rule, and um, another rule can state, okay, bond OH between X and Y if the first one is of type Hydrogen, second one is top type oxygen, and there's a bond between them. And I'm sort of somewhat certain about it. So it looks like a, the product program, as we've seen previously, used for logic programming, but there's some extra parameters in front of the rules. But from a semantical point of view, that's where the interesting part comes in. We use this as a template for creating uh, neural networks, and the way we do it is we basically, as we call it, ground the program, or you can imagine you fit it into Prolog or into the inference engine, you create the proof trees, all based, pretty much all possible proof trees that you can create uh, from this program and uh, merge them together and uh, that sort of creates uh, this uh, directed acyclic graph, which if it follows some particle properties that I will talk about, can be called neural network and computed as well. So this is the routine that we use uh, for the mapping between you know the execution of the logical program that again is templated or given on some sort of high level of abstraction with the weighted logical program and the neural network this is uh, the prescription so this is some of the technical core of the framework uh, I hope it will not be too abstract but uh, you know really the idea is <clears throat> the high level idea is uh, so logical programs when you run them, they give you some execution graph. It's just computational graphs composed of operations over symbols, and uh, mostly they are rooted somewhere in the, in the query. Neural networks, again, it's some computational graphs. You know, it's write it down in TensorFlow and compile it. It's again just composed of some numerical operations, in that case, numerical, uh, and uh, it's just computation. And now the idea is create a one-to-one -one deterministic mapping between the logical computation and the neural computation and uh, being able to compile it back and forth. So this is how we do it. So when you ground the logical program, you know, you've run all the facts through the rules to derive the new facts, you get what is called the lees hermann model, so the set of all possible facts that hold true within the logical program. And for every 
what we call proposition, so that, that would be the true effect in the, in the Herbert model. You create what we call an atom neuron, so this is this computational unit that will be present in the neural network every time there is a proposition that holds true in the logical program. Now for every ground rule, ground means no variables, so you uh, substitute the variables so for some particular objects from the domain, from the universe that you're working in. Uh, so for every ground rule, we have a rule neuron, and on top of them we have some aggregation that uh, is not really important, well, or I will talk about it later. So I'll run in on example because I know it is very abstract. Um, <clears throat> so the atom neurons, so the first computational units. So let's say we have this example of uh, the template, super simple one, just a single rule. I say there's a bono H between two variables, X and Y. The first one is of type hydrogen, the second of type oxygen, there's a bond between them. I'll run it on a particular example of uh, molecules, of classifying molecules, which as you've seen can be represented as graphs or labeled, weighted, whatever graphs. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a special case of the relational databases, which are pretty much hypergraphs. This is the representation of the of uh, the particular learning instance, there's the water molecule, you know, you have two hydrogen atoms, and then oxygen, there's a bond between the couples. If you run the sample through this rule, what is the set of all possible proposition atoms, which will correspond to the atom neurons, in this Herbrand universe? Or the, oh, sorry, the Helice Herbrand model. So this will be all the facts that were already true in the fact, plus the two new derived facts that I can infer through the application of this rule, right? Because I have two bonds between some hydrogen and some oxygen. That is the bond between the first hydrogen in the molecule and the oxygen, and the second hydrogen in the molecule and the oxygen. <coughs> so this is my building blocks, my atom neurons that I will create for this particular template and this particular learning sample. Now, rule neurons, that's the second type of computational unit you have in the graph. So the, the rule stays the same, the sample stays the same. There are two possible ways of how to ground. I mean, that means you know, how to substitute uh, the variables in the rule for the constants in the, <coughs> in the Herbrand uh, base. Two possible ways to ground the rule, two possible uh, rule neurons, which take the atom neurons which are derived from you know, the input atoms, the, uh, the literals from the body of the rule as input. So as you can see, it's something like a computational graph starts to emerge from application of this mapping. Now, why we're doing this, so I said it's just computational graph, you know, the proof tree or proof graph uh, from logical programming is somewhat does some sort of computation just like the neural network. Now there's this neat, pro neat property about <coughs> uh, the computational graphs of neural networks and that is that they are differentiable end to end, which is what we would like to have as well because that's what allows us to do efficient learning, to basically relax the original difficult discrete state space search problem into something that is uh, much more easier, you know, actually the easiest possible uh, optimization routine, you know, going down the hill with uh, gradient descent. And for that, we need a different, uh, differentiable or a smooth representation for the conjunction and disjunction, which are pretty much the only uh, computational units or the only operations that you need for programming in Prolog. So that's why using Prolog as opposed to, I don't know, Java or something else in this case, is a real advantage because it's so simple, it's so basic, the language, there's no extra uh, construct that you would have to map into whatever it means in the neural world. All, the, all you need is conjunction and disjunction. And for differential representation of them, we take inspiration in fuzzy logic, Lukashevich fuzzy logic in this case, and we somewhat approximate them smoothly with sigmoids, which again might sound a little bit weird, but actually, Originally, when people were uh, starting to think about you know, neural networks or perceptrons, 1943 or something like that, they were thinking about them as implementing logical operations. Even the paper was called like that, like immanent, on the immanent logical calculus in the neural activity or something like that. Uh, McCulloch and Pitts uh, with their perceptron. Then 
people are starting to use you know all different sorts of uh, crazy activation functions stacking the perceptrons on top of each other and things got a little bit messy and uh, less interpretable as we see now with deep learning but it works and that's why we want to uh, use it as well and on top of okay so on top of all of that we have what we call aggregation neuron which is really there to aggregate uh, <coughs> rules um, with okay whatever, just to aggregate rules, which you might argue is not really necessary because you could do the same with the atom neurons, but we really like to use it because it helps us to alleviate some sort of uh, problems when, you know, for instance, one rules have a lot of grounding, the other one does not. And uh, there's actually a nice uh, correspondence to convolutional nets that I'll probably mention. So we have this extra computational unit that gives us some, some extra flexibility for modeling more complex stuff. Okay, and you put that all together, you have weighted logical program, you feed it some learning example, you run the inference, it creates this proof network, you use this transcription procedure to turn it into some differential graph. And of course, the whole reason why we're doing this complicated procedure is so that in the end, we are able to optimize the weights, okay, no, I didn't say that, the parameters you know, in front of each of the rules with respect to some learning target. Okay, so we were given a bunch of samples, for instance, the molecules, and we want to learn, you know, what molecule is toxic or carcinogenic, so that's typically the case. And uh, the way we do it, we infer logically the toxicity, and if you're not correct at inferring it, then we just run stochastic gradient descent to update the weights a little bit, and uh, so that, you know, next time our predictions are a little bit more collect correct. And depending on the use of activation functions for conjunction, disjunction, and the aggregation, you can utilize all different sorts of modeling constructs that are uh, useful in different scenarios. I will actually show one of them. Right, uh, yeah, there's this interesting property. Okay, there's probably more <clears throat> than that. So. It is the case that uh, if I feed uh, the program a different input learning example, which might be the graph, hypergraph, logical theory, whatever, it will result into a different neural network because the computation of the graph, you know, all the branching and stuff can happen very differently, which actually but is necessary to <coughs> make the model learn from differently structured data. That is the only way if you don't want to, you know, do that pre-processing uh, into fixed size feature vectors. Uh, and also, there's this weight sharing in the, in, uh, in the ground neural networks that are created, uh, caused by you know, application of the single rule. The rule carries the weight, but it can be applied in different places, you know, like the two different bonds in the water molecules, but with the same parameter, which is which again might sound weird, but actually is the same trick that uh, convolution neural networks are using. So this is also one example to give uh, you this sort of intuition of what I was talking about on pictures. People typically like pictures. So uh, you start with this weighted logical program. This is somewhat artistic depiction of the same thing with no proper semantics. So don't think about it too much, but basically, you know, it encodes some wake intuition, some background knowledge about this classification problem, which says, okay, so I'm, I want to classify molecules, let's call it, I want to classify if it's explosive or not. The molecules compose of some types of atoms. These types of atoms can be of some latent types that I don't really know. So this is the assumption that I'm encoding. It's, it can be completely wake, so it's not like, um, trying to classify something, I write down the set of rules and they already classify, solve the problem, so there's nothing to learn. There's a lot of weakness, which is to be uh, cut out uh, or filled in through the process of learning. So for instance, I don't know what these groups are, it can be you know, like halogens or metals or anything, and the atoms from these groups conform in different relational conformations through the bonds between them, that probably creates some sorts of features. Again, I don't know what types of conformations are important for learning of the explosiveness of the molecule. <clears throat> this is all to be learned, but this is the wake intuition I have about the problem. Probably some conformations of some types of atoms, I don't really know what, happens to be uh, somewhat 
uh, important for the molecule being explosive or not. <clears throat> and this is the feature that I was talking about previously. If I feed this template, you can imagine it's a template, weighted logical program, or template for a neural network, or like meta architecture of the neural network that when fed in with different learning samples, differently structures, results in differently structured <clears throat> neural networks. For instance, if I feed it a hydrogen molecule, it will create somewhat smaller and differently structured uh, neural network than in the case when I feed it with a water molecule. So some new neurons and new structures will appear in the ground network. And this is just a plain vanilla neural network. There is no magic about this. Uh, you have some you know, conjunction disjunctions, or some sigmoids, you have some weights, it's just that these weights are shared sometimes. So this one, this red guy is the same as this red guy, which follows from the fact that it was grounded or inferred, you know, this relationship assigning hydrogen to group one from the same rule as for uh, the second hydrogen, and uh, same for these guys. And it somewhat works. Okay, so you benchmark or different uh, types of, <clears throat> so this is actually on the molecular benchmarks, predicting different uh, properties of molecules. Oh yeah, and if, in case you were wondering how this relates to normal neural networks, so it's a proper extension of normal neural nets. So if you want to, so with the right choice of activation functions, you know, for conjunction and disjunction, you can write down every uh, architecture of a neural network or every computational graph of a neural network as a weighted prolog program, <coughs> not the other way around. That includes, you know, weird stuff like uh, convolutional nets, recursive nets, recurrent nets, stuff like that. So for instance, this is how to encode uh, convolutional filter in the, in the weighted uh, uh, relational logic. It induces the same, exactly the same uh, computation as the convolutional filter. You know, we just have to specify because it's you know the, the relation logic is very general. It, it's not designed for uh, images or for you know matrices of uh, of pixel values. So you have to define you know what is the spatial relationship between the pixels. For, uh, which for which you use some extra predicates, you know, so that this pixel is next to this pixel. One of them is left, one of them is in the middle, one of them is right. So this is the simplest possible convolutional filter. And then just slides and uh, 1D, 1D image, uh, just, for, uh, just for clarity. And this, the grounding procedure, the induction, uh, sorry, deduction in the logical program does the sliding, which does exactly the same computation as the application of the convolutional filter. Uh, so sometimes for people who don't, really don't like logic, uh, this is one way to put it. Uh, this is something like uh, weird generalization of convolution neural nets to arbitrary structure described in uh, relational logic, um, which is not really uh, correct, but uh, gives you somewhat the intuition. Um, okay, and this is so. That's one thing that you can uh, do with that, and it's not uh, useful to do it at all because um, there's just no advantage in uh, encoding normal neural networks in relational logic. Uh, I'll end up, it's just a very inefficient way to uh, write down the normal architectures instead of, you know, just put it into Keras. But uh, so what we try to do is something that you cannot do with normal neural networks. For instance, this modeling scenario. So imagine you are about to learn this. We have entities and uh, properties, and there's duality between them. You can imagine this is like animals, right? And it's animals, um, like some kind of fish, I don't know, carp or salmon. They have some properties, like they have fins or tail or scales. And uh, they belong to some categories, like this salmon, carp, trout. They belong to the category of fish. And uh, these categories uh, somewhat largely determine uh, the properties of the individual entities belonging to categories. So all fish have fins, all fish have scales, and so on. And on the other hand, you have properties, and it's uh, exactly the same case. So all uh, animals that have fins, they're probably of type fish. And 
yeah, reasoning like this. Now, imagine what you are given is set of uh, entities and their corresponding uh, properties. So this is what you're about to learn. So animals, they have different uh, types of properties. And this uh, um, yeah, can be whatever. And this notion of categories that the entities belong to is latent. So you're not given what entity belongs to what category, uh, but you're about to learn it. And the same uh, can follow for the properties. So you can have higher level properties belonging to even higher level properties. And what you would like to learn is to induce this hierarchical structure on the properties and entities jointly. OK, so that's the goal. So this is how we go about it in the, in the formalism of the elliptic relational neural nets. So, you, uh, so this is what you're given learning examples, you know, this entity has this property or not. You encode this wake intuition about the problem. So this is, you know, like the background knowledge in inductive logic programming. This is what we would like to think about as an advantage of this approach. You encode this entity belongs to some category. You know, all entities belong to some categories. Even the categories can belong to some higher level categories that uh, the categories uh, of entities are connected to some categories of properties. There's a transitivity relation, you know, so that you inherit uh, the properties from the higher uh, level of hierarchy. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So transitivity in the, in the, in the hierarchy of the, of the uh, categories for both entities and properties and inheritance of the of the of the properties just like in a you know phylogenetic uh, tree with animals and uh, the funny stuff is that if you train this on data <laughs> uh, you can inter inter interpret uh, these weights, you know, assigning, oh, sorry, these weights, assigning entities into categories as endowing embedding space for the original entities. And if you do, you know, some PCA projection after that, you can actually interpret these uh, weights as embeddings for uh, the entities within the latent space of the categories that you are just learning. And it somewhat clusters, uh, you know, carnivores, herbivores together, and so on. Now, the last part, uh, what I was silent yet about. Uh, is how did I come up with the rules in the beginning, right? So in some cases, it's an advantage that you have some knowledge about the problem at hand, and you can encode uh, your knowledge or at least some wake intuition about it in the, in the weighted rules. But sometimes you have just no idea about the problem that you are about to solve. And this is where the normal ILP kicks in, the inductive logic programming, not integer linear programming. Also, there are some correspondence between those two, too. Uh, and for that, uh, we do something very simple. Follow exactly what most of the inductive logic programming algorithms do. You start with actually the opposite from the example I've shown you, not from the most specific hypothesis, but from the most general one. You start from scratch with no rules at all, and you just iteratively keep searching for what we call a good rules. Good rule is a rule that is somewhat good at classifying uh, the positive neg examples from the negative ones. We do this one at a time, and after learning of each new rule, we just relearn the parameters, the weights, and uh, you know repeat this. When introducing these new rules, what we do as well is called predicate invention. That is, okay, maybe on the way, just as in the case of the deep neural nets, there are some auxiliary intermediate concepts that are not directly you know, the prediction target, but might be somewhat useful and reused in different you know, proof paths or different inference paths in the, in the neural net. Uh, that's what I call you know, latent predicates or predicate invention. That's the predicates that are not present you know, in the learning domain, nor they are the learning targets. And uh, yes, this is uh, how we generate them very roughly. And, uh, just an overview of the structure learning. So how you start from not having any weighted program at all into having weighted program you know, with structure and the parameters optimized for the learning problem at hand. You're given learning examples. 
can be arbitrary relational structures. There are some hyperparameters like you know, the embedding space for the relational, uh, for learning of the relational uh, representations. Uh, you initialize the weights somewhat randomly, you derived, uh, uh, you derive all the facts that hold true at the beginning, which will be probably just the learning examples, then you iteratively start searching for, you know, the best rule with respect to some uh, performance metric, or like log loss in this case, and uh, then you extend them. Uh, these new rules, you say they infer, you know, new predicates that might then be reused with the new rules that might be building on top of those. So that's the, that's the stacked learning, which results into you know, somewhat deep architectures of the neural nets, meaning there's multiple rules stacked on top of each other. You know, merge them with what you learn already with the rules, retrain the weights, and uh, derive the new facts. So you'll possibly be able to derive facts that you were not able to derive before with new truth values, and you repeat the procedure. And it still somewhat works. And uh, I, yeah, so this is one particularly interesting thing, at least from the point of view of uh, inductive logic programming or relational learning, learning with logic. They also do this, uh, what they call the predicate invention. That's not what we were coming up with. We're coming up with just one solution to it, which we believe is particularly good because of this you know, inherent notion of similarity between symbols. If you think about them in the embedding space as opposed to in the crisp logical sense, is that once you introduce this new predicate, this new logical symbol, the representation of it can change later. That's why I call it theory refinement. It's a very hard problem in logical learning because you know you can have you introduce a new concept and then later you find now there are some exceptions to it and you probably have to redefine it and so on. This comes uh, for free from the fact that the latent predicates are based uh, somewhat. Uh, Wagley or they laid out in the embedding space that is uh, part of the learning process. So this is just an evolution of uh, the concepts, again, after some uh, PCA projection or something, uh, through the structure learning. Uh, so that means there's no need for explicit theory refinement. It's just you come up with a new <coughs> word, you know, like, um, I don't know, like Karol Chapek introduced the word robot. He probably meant something by it at the time in the context in which he lived, then it turned slowly, you know, through the interactions of that word with the surrounding world, so in different relational contexts that people use the word, into a different meaning than it was before. And this is something that we're trying to emulate with this. Very last thing, uh, trying to prove that this does something uh, actually interesting or actually non-trivial under the hood uh, because you know even at the in the context of uh, classifying molecules graphs hypergraphs generally uh, sometimes the solution of transforming into the feature vector or just you know going for the single car in the in the train classification problem is enough to solve the problem. So sometimes you have a molecule and all you really care about, all that is really uh, largely uh, deterministic of the property, you know, toxicity of the molecule is that if there is a, a brom atom in there, or if there is a fluor atom in there, then the molecule is largely toxic and you don't really care if that uh, particular atom is connected with a different atom of a different type. So we created this artificial problem, which is really some sort of generalization of the XOR uh, learning problem uh, into relational setting. Imagine you are given a graph, and uh, this is somewhat a classification of uh, the graph uh, coloring problem, uh, classification version. So it is colored, but each color has different sets of shades. You know, we have red, but I also have a light red, uh, dark red, and so on. But you're somewhat color blind and not able to observe the colors themselves, but just the shades, you know, on the level, on, on a gray scale. And what you are about to classify is whether the graph is correctly colored in the sense of, you know, all neighboring vertices have different colors. You don't care about the shades. Why this is a hard problem? And so first, you're not given the correspondence of the shades to colors, so this is anonymous, this you have to learn. So 
this is uh, latent uh, pretty good learning. You are about to learn the colors definitions, which you are not given. But uh, the, 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 the hard part is that learning the colors does not give you absolutely any information on their own. Uh, you know, learning that there is a red node in the graph is completely decorrelated from the learning target, which is whether this graph is correctly colored. You really need to take a look at the combinations, whether this red node is next to some node that is also of some shade of red. So any greedy strategy will fail at this problem. And uh, so that's what we uh, also uh, try to evaluate. So we bring it down to what we call the propositional setting. So what we work typically in is the relational setting on the higher level of abstraction, you know, constraining between sets of variables instead of individual variables, you know, graph instead of single edges, but you know, to compare with normal neural nets, we bring into what we call the propositional setting, so the fixed size representation setting, just a single edge, and you no know, set of shades, set of curls, given a lot of examples of uh, coloring of the single edge, try to come up with a you know, weighted hypothesis that correctly classifies uh, the examples. And we are able to solve the problem and it's comparably more difficult to normal neural nets because we were able to come up you know, with this latent. So this is the hypothesis, okay, so the graph is not <coughs> correctly colored. It's actually more efficient to learn the reverse case you know, than to learn all possible combinations of the colors that are allowed. So it's better to, to take on those that are not allowed. So if the first node, if it's of the same type, you know, color one, zero, or cluster zero, or whatever, as, this, as the second one, there's an edge between them, then it is wrong. And uh, same for, you know, three colors that are in there. We're not given the definition of the colors. This is what we need to learn. And we are able to do that. So that's just one funny example of what you can do with this. So this brings me to conclusion. So this framework we call lifted relational neural networks. Okay, so you, if you happen to, for any reason, uh, be familiar with uh, what's called the Markov logic networks, then you can think about it as an analogy to that. So it's templating or lifting of, in that case, it's uh, Markov networks. In our case, it's neural networks, which brings all different sorts of complexities uh, with it. So that's why it's different. Or in the lightweight version of the explanation, you can imagine it's somewhat generalization of convolutional nets to all different uh, sorts of uh, complex data. And uh, yeah, the, they, re they result in the same features, which is the weight tying in the corresponding uh, ground models, Markov network in case of Markov uh, logic networks, or if you you know, draw this uh, weird diagrams of grounding convolutional neural net, you know, the unfolding of the convolutional filter, you get a weight tying in there as well, which is induced by weight sharing as prescribed by the convolutional filter. You can imagine the convolutional filter is the rule, and by application of the rule, you uh, induce this weight sharing. Uh, this is why we think it's good, maybe. Uh, you can encode all different sorts of stuff uh, possibly much more general than with normal models. Whether it is useful, as a question, uh, but you can. Uh, you can learn these latent predicates, which is something that's the biggest hype. And uh, <coughs> so that's the, that's the selling point. You can learn from scratch, you know, with these ILP methods. Uh, big disadvantage is computational complexity, which in the most general case, it's still, you know, as, as complicated as uh, the original ILP. But of course, the computational complexity is uh, completely determined by the complexity of the template that you're using and complexity of the learning problem that you want to solve. If you want to solve a Turing complete problem, then you probably cannot expect that learning is going to be easy. Okay, uh, I guess that's it. I'm sort of on time, I hope. Thanks for listening. Okay, we have some space for questions, so in case there are some questions, I will pass you the <laughs> microphone. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so in normal neural networks, there's always some input you feed into them and read some output. So 
I didn't get what is here, the input, yeah. and what is the output. Yeah, okay, good question. Uh, something that should probably be very obvious and I didn't say it properly. Uh, the problem is that there is no real input and output in here, so the notion of input and output is a little bit confused in here because you don't feed anything into the logical program. What you do you, is you extend the program with the learning sample and then you ground it. Okay, so this is how you actually create a neural network. So that's why every single sample creates a different neural network. So there's no input actually into the neural network, but the information about the learning sample is encoded into the structure of the, of the neural network. So every sample creates a different sort of computation graph. So that's what allows us to generalize over different samples. So no real input, but mostly you can imagine that the learning samples are facts. If, there, if there's only facts in the learning sample and in the template there's only rules, then you can imagine that the facts are somewhat input to the rules. You know, in, in, the, in the right to left sense, you're inferring you know, the head from the facts that are given by the sample. So the facts are the input and the output is pretty much any predicate or any literal in the Herman model in the neural network for which you are given the target label. So you are given you know, this program and it can again be different learning target for every example, but what you're optimizing for is the discrepancy between the predicted truth value of any literal, which can be you know, this group one or you know, the explosive, uh, explosive atom neuron, uh, which will have some output it's a computational unit that has some input and output. As, as soon as you translate it into a neural network, it's just numerical out inputs, numerical outputs, and everything is smooth and differentiable. So that's the target. And it can be defined over set, again, over set of, uh, of the atoms, meaning the neurons in, in every ground neural network differently. But you just simply measure mean square or log loss, whatever, on top of that, and you, uh, that's what you optimize through the regular means. So that's for input and output. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, would you recommend to the audience here at this point to use uh, this approach to any practical problems and how <laughs> to find them? And is there some open source framework to use or would we have to implement everything from scratch? Yeah, great, very fair questions. Um, so I'm pretty much implementing this uh, myself. It's on GitHub, but it's not. I don't recommend anyone to use it yet. But I'm really planning to <coughs> to put it out hopefully soon, like in a matter of few months. So I mean, I've been working on it for two years or maybe three years. It's so few people are using it, not for practical problems, but for you know these machine learning benchmarks in the in the scientific community and for the relational problems, not for anything practical. And uh, at this time, I mean, you can encode. You know, other models with that, like normal neural nets, but there's no advantage in doing this. So at this at this stage, there's no practical use of this. <laughs> Sounds funny. Uh, yeah, it's a pure it's a pure uh, academic thingy. So at the moment. can it be described uh, in some simple terms what uh, remains to be done uh, until this becomes practical to some problems? Yeah. So what I'm trying to do now is to bring this a little bit to uh, you know the normal user of uh, machine learning frameworks is to create a Python front-end interface for writing down the log weighted logical programs and uh, you know in Jupyter notebooks with the syntax highlighting and stuff like that uh, with one uh, of my students and uh, to port the backend uh, to TensorFlow or PyTorch so that I don't have to you know do all the computation of graphs myself which is what I'm doing at the moment and uh, so that's that's not what would bring it uh, closer to, to the practical use. I think the front-end interface, to make the front-end interface more user-friendly is what I have to do to, you know, as you see, it's a little bit obscure. You don't want to write uh, these guys down into a text file with no error checking, no syntax highlighting, nothing, which is how it works at the moment. And then just some random Java error throws back at you uh, in the middle of the computation. So that's what that's the gap between practical use of this. And then, of course, we're still looking for, you know, some killer apps for this. We did some, you know, these molecules, did a little bit of some NLP stuff, and uh, some knowledge base uh, completion, and small, small stuff like this. 
but it, it doesn't scale to big knowledge bases. It doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't scale properly, partially because of the way it is implemented, partially because the templates are often pretty complex to compute. Thank you for the interesting talk. I have a question. Let's say you have a like logical program and constructed neural net. And what if you want to incorporate some new knowledge which might contain like some variables from this like logical problem, uh, pro uh, program and some new variables and some new propositions? Can you somehow update the neural net or you need to like reconstruct the whole net from scratch? Oh, that's an interesting question. So yeah, if you so the way we do it now is you reground everything from scratch. Yeah, but maybe we but can just slightly change something in existing neural net to. Yeah, that would speed up uh, speed up the grounding procedure, uh, hopefully. Yeah, we are thinking in this direction that, in some restricted setting, when you know that, because if you add a new rule, in the more general sense, it can completely change the structure of the neural network. It can you know completely bring down. If, for instance, I don't know, you you create a. <coughs> Uh, a contradiction in, in, in template or anything like that, and the thing goes crazy. But uh, it's just like a, it's like a program. If you change anything in, in, in that, if you add a new rule, it can completely change the semantic. So in the most general sense, I don't know how to solve this issue, but certainly there are some current cases that if you add, you know, if you just add a <coughs> new atom type in here and the connection to the groups, the, the only thing that can, can happen is that in the neural net, you will have, uh, actually no, no, it will change the structure as well. Um, I don't know, I don't know how to do, like incremental crowning. Yeah, like to add new nodes and like maybe new edges. D don't, don't retrain all the time, don't reconstruct the new like neural net all the time. If you want to add, for example, five new statements to the, I mm -hmm. don't know, 1,000 of statements, mm -hmm. why do you need to retrain everything? Uh, because it's not monotonic in this sense, like uh, because it can really change everything. That's why we have to retrain everything. But in in some restricted setting, uh, this might work. I'm not sure about what the restrictions would be. Okay. You Thank would you. have to prove some uh, invariance or some monotonicity on what you're adding, and then prove that you know there's no funny uh, recursion or uh, nothing like that happening. Thanks. Yeah, do we have more questions? Okay. Uh, you said that you uh, create the graph for each sample differently. Uh, do you reuse at least some of the rules that, for instance, you already know that this bond has like some weights? Do you have? Do you do some weight sharing between the different graphs, or do you always yeah, reset? Totally, that's totally the case. So the weight sharing is can be within each individual graph and across the different graphs. Every time I ground the same rule. So every time I'm talking about any bond between any two atoms, it's going to be induced by the same rule, meaning applying the same parameter, same weight. So the weights are shared across the learning examples as well as within them. Uh, just one like small note. You said that you know sometimes some of the weights. So do you like initialize the weights? Like you said, you, know, you are pretty sure about this bond or do you learn all the weights from scratch? You can choose both. So you can, you can, uh, you know, f if you're sure about what the weight of the rule should be in the beginning, you just fix the weight and it's not updatable. If you're not sure, you just initialize it randomly and optimize and for that. Does it always converge? Uh, for the non-recurrent case, I would say it does. Well, <laughs> probably. I don't have any formal proof of convergence. Just like, I mean, it's a neural network <laughs> in the end. Okay, one last question. Just an idea, could this approach be used to learn a grammar from a sample of texts? I mean, the grammar in the computing sense. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what the normal ILP is about. So without uh, the weights, or maybe with the weights like probabilistic grammar, that's about learning grammar, logical programs uh, from, uh, from the examples. So that's what the normal inductive logic programming is about. So as employed in the structural learning part, that's what we were learning, basically weighted grammars, in a sense. Okay, so thank you once again.